Hi everyone and welcome to our first online lecture for Biology 330-505, Biomedical Physiology, formerly uh, Human Physiology. Uh, here's all my contact information. You've seen this before, but I will always probably put this slide at the beginning uh, just so that you have a, a quick reference. I'll also try to put uh, time uh, stamps in the video too, so to make it easier for you to find certain, uh, for certain slides and so forth. So in this class, we're going to have four major units. And unit one is uh, a little bit of an extension beyond Bio 165, and that is we're going to deal with cellular physiology. And that certainly involves a little bit of understanding at the, the, the biomolecular level. That sounds like a, a mouthful, but it's really not as difficult as, as it might seem. The key is, is the words. It's the terminology. Uh, talking about membranes, acid bases. Uh, we're going to talk about osmolarity. Uh, that's a, a little bit versus tonicity. Um, those of you who are chemistry majors uh, might have a little bit of, uh, of a different view of this, but we're going to use the physiologic view. And then cell signaling. That signaling then becomes the segue for the signaling physiology, which is uh, endocrinology, neurons, and senses. Uh, and then uh, later on, we're going to get into the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, uh, which is a source of a major source of adverse uh, symptoms and signs in people. So we want to work on that a little bit, get you guys a head start in that direction. Unit three is about movement and motion, what I call contraction physiology. This is going to be skeletal muscle, uh, it's going to be heart muscle, and smooth muscle. So we're going to be going through some of those mechanisms. Again, we're going to be feeding back into some of what we talk about. And that's an important aspect of this class. It's scaffolded. What we do up here has tremendous importance for what we do down here and down here. It's a scaffolded class. We have to build on the knowledge as we go. And then finally, we get into what's called transport physiology, which in some cases involves muscles. Okay. We're going to talk about the respiration and the vascular system. Uh, we're going to talk about gas exchange and transport in, in the blood vessels and the tissues and the lungs. And then um, the, the, uh, the, ural, uh, the urinary system, the renal system. I have overlapping words there. So those are our four units for this semester, and we're going to have exams at the ends of each of these units. Uh, so we're going to start with cellular physiology. We're going to start with chapter one and the themes of physiology. The reading assignment for chapter one is basically pages one through 22. Uh, it's not a very complicated chapter, just a few things to, uh, to integrate, but nevertheless, it's important to uh, get through that reading. These, these learning goals here are what we would call scalable themes. Um, you might have heard that if you've had 165. What we mean by a scalable theme is that we can see these things at a very, very small scale, like subatomic even, all the way through um, uh, but the, the entire planet, if you will, the entire ecosystem. It's integrative. We're using chemistry. We're using physics, gas laws, pHs, and osmolarity, and so forth. So we're integrating all of those things that you, uh, that you had to take early on, and now we're putting them together in the healthcare paradigm. Function and mechanism. Uh, what I'm going to emphasize here with function and mechanism is that we need to drill down a little bit in mechanism now. It's not enough to know that muscles contract. When, when people begin to break, if you will, if they stop functioning properly, we need to narrow this down. And that's why working in that direction in a class like this is so important and why this class is considered a prerequisite for many, many graduate programs. The idea of homeostasis, again, these things are sort of related. We, it's, homeostasis is a, is a generic uh, concept, and I want to just refine it a little bit for you. The idea of a homeostatic window and the control systems that we use, the energy flow that we use in order to, to, to maintain that homeostatic window. Energy flow throughout, so we're going to talk about that a little bit in, in the next few chapters. And then the control systems, uh, specifically negative feedback, positive feedback, and something called feed forward control systems uh, that we will get a little more specific. So some of the specifics that we're going to have in this chapter involve that control, those control systems. 
A great video for sort of seeing the idea of scalable concepts is a video, it's actually a book as well, uh, by this author, David Foster Wallace. This is a wonderful video, not only for this class, in terms of showing you how some of the largest concepts are often the most difficult to see and understand. Um, this is a great example of perspective on not only uh, uh, large concepts, but also your, uh, your undergraduate education and to a certain extent, your graduate education as well. So uh, go to Vimeo and check this video out. It's about a nine minute video. It's really, it's really worth your time. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, I don't want to belabor it too much. We are integrating sciences. We're crossing boundaries. Uh, I actually teach an FYS course called Life Without Borders. The idea that uh, that that we that that even though we talk about chemistry and physics and biology, they're all interrelated. So we're going to be using all of that stuff that you've worked so hard to uh, to master coming into this class and hopefully putting it all together into the healthcare paradigm, if you will, the well-being paradigm. In order to get there, one of the most important things for you guys in this class is mastering terminology. Uh, many of you uh, come, have come through um, anatomy, like for instance, uh, 305, or maybe you took 103 or 104. Think about your anatomy class. It was all terminology much of the time. And so we're gonna be extending on that. What we're gonna be using is functional terminology. How, what, is, what does it mean to say uh, excitation, contraction, coupling? Okay, so anything bolded in your textbook, you just probably write it down and work on that word. Same thing's true if it's italicized as well. It's often the italicization is the explanation behind a bolded term. This is where uh, most of your memorization, if you're gonna do it, is going to live, is in the terminology. So if, if, if you like memorizing things, start with the terminology. That's a good, good start. We are going to integrate those concepts that we talked about in the previous slides, like for instance, homeostasis, these big ideas. I'm going to use that to help you um, visualize these things. Um, they consider visualizing uh, a given phenomenon the highest level of analysis. We talk about people that have great vision, uh, not in terms of ocular vision, but vision in terms of a conceptual vision. We're going to try to work on that with you, try to get you to where you can visualize these things and imagine the ramifications in them. But we are going to get into the how, mechanisms and interactions. Uh, and we're going to use maps to do this. I call these things silver thornograms. So I'll show you an example of that. The, we are going to drill down deeper into mechanisms um, because, again, the, the, the mechanism is what drives the interventions and the therapies. So understanding mechanism is going to give you better tools. Even if you're not going to be a physician, it's a good idea to understand how the therapy works. It'll help you dovetail whatever you're doing in the healthcare team to whatever the, the other healthcare providers are doing. And here's what I mean as an example of a silver thornogram. We are progressing from a starting point through different possibilities leading to outcomes and responses. Uh, silver thorn uses different colors, different shapes in order to emphasize the different steps and so forth. And so one of my goals in this class is to help you get stronger at looking at a figure like this and understanding how it works. We start here. We get some sort of an external change in response, attempt to compensate. Do they compensate? Yes or no. Uh, if it's yes, then we have wellness, et cetera. I'm going to talk about this slide a little later, specifically in the homeostatic window, but I wanted to give you the idea that we are going to try to emphasize a skill set of, of, of being able to interpret figures like this. One of the aspects of the idea that uh, integrate, that physiology is an integrative science is, is the fact that when we integrate different inputs, we get what are known as uh, emergent properties. When we have different levels of organization, different types of inputs, 
that leads to complex uh, phenomena that we can't always predict. That's what the idea of emergent is, that all of a sudden it appears and we didn't expect it. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. And I'd like you to try to understand this concept because emergent properties are one of the major issues in dealing with healthcare. Let's say, for instance, you have somebody who has muscle weakness and they happen to have uh, diabetes or um, uh, maybe they have a fever and so forth. Teasing out what those inputs are that are really contributing to that muscle weakness is part of a major aspect of problem solving in healthcare. And it's, it's about emergent properties. Here's a, here's a quick example for you. I'm gonna show you a couple examples over the next few slides. One example is this. We've got this uh, very simple system. We put a human being on here, and we can predict that if the human being begins actuating this, this lever system here, that the wheel will turn and that person will begin you know, moving uh, horizontally, if you will, across a surface. But if you look at these two videos right here, this one here is just a couple minutes long. And again, it's a really cool video. It's one of my favorites. Uh, this one makes me tear up a little bit. It, it reminds me of, uh, of an earlier time in my life. In any case, what can we see when we actually add some more inputs? Let me show you what I mean. Next slide. Would you have ever predicted that somebody could do a tabletop, this is what this maneuver is, is called, on a bicycle based on the sum of the parts? Now, it may seem self-evident because we see videos like this all the time, but I imagine 100 years ago, nobody would have ever predicted that. It would have been a truly an emergent property. So I challenge you to go into those videos that I, that I showed you and see if you can't identify examples of emergent properties. See if you can identify examples of emergent properties in your own life, too. It never hurts. The idea of opening and, and looking for patterns is, uh, is, is, a, is a good skill to have. Here's an example of what I mean by when you add one input, you can increase the complexity uh, substantially. So we have one ball here, a given type of motion with the arms going on. We add two balls, and fundamentally the motion is the same but you can see that the complexity seems to have uh, increased substantially. Or maybe perhaps we can change the motion slightly and now we have yet a different type of outcome. Or maybe we add an additional input. Again, that's back to that sort of original motion, but now we're doing a sort of a catch and release or maybe we can do something like this. Again, that original motion is still there. It's just that now that what we're doing is just slightly, you know, one difference in input. Or we can even do something like this. These are all examples of emergent properties in relatively simple systems. Even something here. Or now let's add, go from three balls, let's go to four, okay, or six. Even though the fundamental mechanism is simple, the outcome from that fundamental mechanism can be complex. And imagine when we have a bunch of different things going on. Okay, that's what we're going to try to do is work on that skill set of being able to manage complexity by looking at the simple mechanisms. Okay. And now just a few words, a few couple of slides about function and mechanism. Again, we're doing a little bit of hand waving at this time, but again, to, to get a start on why we're going to focus on mechanism a little bit. Here's an example of what I mean by function versus mechanism. So for instance, let's uh, use uh, skeletal muscle. We're going to be using a reductionist approach in this class. We're going to start. We're going to try to drill down to uh, a point of, of cellular mechanism, subcellular mechanism. We're not going to get into all of the proteins and this and that. We will talk about proteins at certain times. But what we're going to do is we're going to break this down because this is where we go when we try to identify a specific therapy. So, for instance, muscles contract and generate force. So that's great. Yeah, we do. That's fine, but on an exam, that's not going to fly. Okay, that may be useful in say high school or very very early physiology, but it's not good enough in this class. Rather, we're going to get something like this. Now, this is a bit more, you know, this is a bit wordy. No, no offense, but it, it's a bit wordy. But this would be a great answer for how muscles contract. We release calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum changes the conformational structure of the troponin tropomyosin when we get there that'll make sense to you 
uh, it allows actins to bind, and then uh, we get what's known as a power stroke. This is a much better answer than the idea of muscles generate contractive force. We're working on the how, we're working on the reductionist approach. And structure and function are very, very closely related. And you can actually use structure to help gain some insight into function. And if you've taken 305 or, or anatomy class, you might have alluded to function by, based on a, a given structure, right? The articulations and joints, the shapes of bones, the density of bones, et cetera. For our purposes, we're going to talk about what I call big mechs. These are big mechanisms that we present step by step. We're going to talk about compartmentalization or compartmentation is another way of, of putting that phrase we, because the function in here is very, very different from the function inside the ER or the mitochondria or the Golgi. We have compartments in eukaryotic cells, very, very important for proper regulation of function. Moving into the idea of that homeostatic window, regulating energy flow and information flow, which are, again, very, very closely related concepts. So let's talk about homeostasis a little bit, this idea of homeostatic window. Maintaining that internal stability, what we talk, call is we call it a dynamic steady state. It is not a static value. It's always oscillating. Your body temperature is always oscillating. Your body pH is always varying depending on what you're doing. And what we do is we respond to that change and try to keep it within a, a narrow window range. And that's what we mean, homeostatic window. We're trying to maintain, we're using energy and information flow and responses to keep us in a relatively narrow uh, homeostatic window. We sometimes refer to that as an internal environment. Uh, that's, that's most of what we see, like for instance, body pH or osmolarity, temperature, and so forth. It's always through some kind of a sensor integrator and effector control system. The body senses a departure, it decides what the, the appropriate response is, and then it sends out a response that leads to hopefully a return to homeostasis. The integrator can be within a cell or it can be within an ecosystem. Uh, we talk about, uh, for instance, let's, let's take this to a larger level. Let's say we, we get bombed at Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Well, we decide what our response is and we go out and we try to do effects so that that 9-11 never happens again. That's an example of a, of, of a system at a you know, multi-organismal system. Or maybe in our cells, we, we sense that we have a, 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 the osmolarity is off, we activate proteins, and then we affect something that affects osmolarity inside the cell. So this is a scalable concept. And blood pH is a near perfect example of what we would refer to as a homeostatic window. That is to say, in this relatively narrow range between somewhere around 7.35 and 7.42, they're a little narrower, 7.38, 7.42, that's fine. In any case, 7.35, 7.45, we keep it in that area. If we begin to get either higher, that we call that alkalosis, we begin to see symptoms. Even above 7.45, we begin to see modest, if not severe symptoms. Uh, the same is true on the opposite direction. If we become more and more acidotic, the, the symptoms become progressively severe. This is a perfect example right here, this, this area right here of a homeostatic window, a range of values that the organism attempts to maintain a given variable. And again, this can occur at multiple levels. It can be at the subcellular level or it can be at the multi-organismal ecological level. We get some sort of change, whether it's internal, like for instance, uh, a buildup of a metabolite, or perhaps it's external, like maybe we uh, find ourselves being exposed to something like a, like a virus, for instance, leads to a loss of homeostasis that's sensed by the entity. We say organism here, because we're thinking about globally physiology, but this could occur at the subcellular level or it could occur at the uh, ecological level. It's somehow perceived, if you will, it is sensed. That leads to an attempt to correct either. We, perhaps in the case of a virus, we have inflammation or we, we, we develop antibodies or something along those lines. 
control system response. So we, 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 we perceive the departure from homeostasis. We, we route that information to the appropriate effectors. Maybe it's muscular contraction, maybe it's uh, met metabolic rate, uh, maybe it's producing a metabolite that we need that gets us back to that homeostatic window where the sensor is no longer uh, being activated. Right? Dynamic steady state. It's not the same as equilibrium. You want to see a human at equilibrium? I'll show you a dead body. Okay? That person dies, They're, they assume room temperature, they achieve an, a temperature equilibrium. So if the room is warmer, they'll be warmer. If the room is colder, they'll be colder. But a person who's alive, their body tends to stay somewhere around 97, 98 degrees, even when we start to get a little bit chilly. Now, let's say they stay in that chilly environment and their body temperature starts to drop. The body's going to start trying to correct for that, either through shivering or perhaps a complex behavior like putting on a coat or leaving the room for a warmer place. All of those are examples of this same fundamental phenomenon. We censor we integrate the, 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 the response to the, our effectors. That leads to a response that hopefully alleviates the departure in homeostasis. And if we have successful compensation, we reestablish homeostasis, then that's great. However, when we fail to compensate, this is the origin of what we call pathology or disease. That inability to compensate for a departure from the homeostatic window. Uh, and so we lose that. Now we move into an increasingly severe situation. And we call this failure to compensate, the study of the failure to compensate. We call that pathophysiology. I'm going to try to bring some of that into you guys uh, as we go uh, so that you can see why we talk about certain mechanisms and so forth. So you understand where this all goes. If we if failure to compensate, maybe it, the imbalance remains and we have a, a pathological state, or in some cases, what we get is a maladaptive response. The attempt to compensate actually worsens the disease or pathology. For instance, maybe uh, we catch a cold or we catch a virus and our temperature goes up. That's, that's an attempt to kill off the virus, make the virus more vulnerable to immune system. But if that fever gets out of control, that becomes a maladaptive uh, situation. And that's what pathophysiology is about. It's a fascinating topic. I strongly recommend the better you understand that, the better you'll understand your patients and clients. Our next major theme is energy flow. The fact that living organisms need to acquire transform, store, and release energy in a regulated fashion. That's part of the homeostatic window. And it's expensive. It requires a lot of integrated systems. And again, the, the simple idea is that we need energy to do things. We also need energy to convey information. The idea of sensory perception, integration, and response all require energy flow. Okay, so we're going to integrate these systems. We're going to integrate that chemistry with the physics. We're going to integrate uh, biology, the, the reasons why, adjusting that homeostatic window. But it is expensive. For instance, and I use this factoid in 165 a lot, even if you only weigh 100 pounds or 110 pounds, your body goes through 150 pounds of ATP every day. Pretty amazing stuff. It's expensive. It requires a lot of complex regulation and energy flow. Okay? We, we build and maintain the organs and tissues, and we invest metabolism in order to sustain those homeostatic windows. Why is it expensive? Because oftentimes conditions can vary significantly. Uh, we often need very robust systems. That's why it's expensive. You've got to be able to move things continuously through systems that function. If they don't function, then we begin to depart from a dynamic steady state that leads to pathology, homeostasis. By way of example here, I want to get started on something that you should really uh, begin to understand uh, as part of this course. We're going to do a little bit of terminology here playing on that theme. 
when we have cells, cells have a, a compartment unto themselves. We have what's called an intracellular compartment, intracellular fluid. Turns out if this is total body water here, this, this larger two-tone box, two-thirds of all your body water is actually inside your cells. Your blood plasma, the fluids that are outside the cells, lymph and what we call extracellular fluid, are all lumped into this box. And then even blood plasma is a small piece of this larger uh, box. So most of the fluid in your body, two-thirds of it roughly, is inside your cells. So we have intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid, and we even have compartments uh, in both of these inside the nucleus, inside the mitochondria, inside a, a, uh, a vacuole, or maybe we're inside the blood plasma, inside lymph, and so forth. So get to know this, the, these compartments because we're going to be talking about them quite a lot throughout the semester. Moreover, when we look at intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, so here's extracellular, intracellular, I want you to know this cold. Okay, I want you to know this cold because this is one of the major ways that a cell does stuff. It does stuff by establishing a, a chemical disequilibrium. They are not in equilibrium. We have lots and lots of potassium inside the cells. Look how much potassium we have in here in purple relative to potassium outside the cells. So these, the potassium levels are in disequilibrium across the plasma membrane. It's very, very important. Same thing's true with sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride are quite high in the extracellular fluid relative to intracellular fluid. A lot of that 150 pounds of ATP that I was talking about is spent on doing just this, pumping sodium and chloride out of the cell and pumping potassium in. So get to know this, know this cold because it will make some of the mechanisms later on, particularly the active transport mechanisms, much, much easier for you. So get this down. So if you see high potassium, then you think well, that should be what we see inside the cells. High chloride and high sodium outside the cells. We're gonna add a few more variables to this later on, but for now it's these three things, sodium, chloride, potassium. I'm going to put this figure inside uh, one of the folders on ACE for you. I am a strong proponent of the idea of, of draw it to know it. If you really want to get the most out of your study time, and I know your time is precious, then let's do things that maximize the quality of that study time. Let's use multiple ways of learning. Uh, passive learning will generally not cut it in this class unless you are truly gifted. Okay, there are gifted students. I have seen some people that just knock my socks off, blow me away. They're amazing people. They might have talents, but most of us, the rest of us, have to learn in different ways and using strength in this. So I'm going to put this in here, print it out. Use it to draw. Use it as practice for learning. When you use your motor skills, you're learning. When you use your question asking, you're learning. When you're wondering about things, you're learning. So I'm gonna print that out for you. So, so, and here's where we go with this. Next slide. Maybe what we can do is we can add some proteins to this, like for instance, our sodium potassium pump. It means it's gonna be using ATP, by the way. Or maybe we're gonna have a channel in here. We can add that. You can see where this goes. So we're gonna pump sodium into the cell or out of the cell excuse me and we're going to pump potassium into the cell using atp okay or maybe we're going to use that you know use the the electrical gradient that we generate the change in voltage because we're going to pump these things differentially and now we can use that gradient to move things like for instance move wastes out of the cell when we have lots of sodium outside the cell it wants to come in the cell, so why don't we let it and at the same time pump something out using the gradient that we generated from this guy? Or perhaps we can let sodium flow back in. Again, this idea of voltage. We use voltage signaling. We use voltage to, for, energy, or for information flow. We're going to talk about all of these mechanisms coming up. So print that blank figure out and get ready to draw some of this stuff in. Use colors. Use all sorts of things. Make it as fun as possible. I know it's hard work, especially in this COVID area. I, 
I don't envy you guys. It's hard work for me, and I know it's hard work for you. So help me, you know, I will help you in any way that I can, and this is one of those ways. In our last theme, and it fits closely with uh, with the energy flow, and I've talked about it already a little bit, is information flow. Information flow can be energy flow. It can be changes that affect signaling and responses. Like, for instance, I mentioned the, uh, the change in voltage across the cell. That can be a form of information flow that then leads to a response. And that information flow influences control systems. If in homeostasis, we have variables that we're regulating. Okay. That homeostatic window, if you will, we're going to use, we're going to regulate those variables with control systems. We're going to use information flow to influence those control systems. Control systems always have three fundamental factors. They can be very complicated or they can be quite simple. There has to be an input signal. There has to be some sort of way to sense and then coordinate that input signal to an effector leading to some kind of an output. We have local control that is occurring at the cell, at the site. We have what's called reflex control, which is usually multi-tissue, usually more systemic in nature. For instance, if we stretch your patellar tendon uh, abruptly, we get a signal that's sent to your, uh, your spinal cord that then causes your quadriceps to contract briefly. We call that the patellar reflex. Reflex control is not merely uh, neuromuscular. It can be endocrine, it can be neurologic, it can be all sorts of things. We're talking about multicellular, multi-tissue level when we talk about reflex control. So long distance signaling, more than a few cell diameters, often using the nervous system and endocrine system. So long distance. So when we get into chapters uh, six and seven and nine, uh, we'll, we'll, be, or we'll be talking about those. Many of these reflexes are, in fact, feedback loops, and we talk about negative, positive, and feed forward. Negative, what we're doing is we're stabilizing a variable, and what does that mean? It means we're bringing it back to a basal value, to a, to a standard value, like, for instance, our pH. If our pH gets too low, we're going to try to do things to bring it back to that homeostatic window. If our pH is too high, we're going to bring it back to that homeostatic window. We're returning it to a homeostatic window. And that's negative feedback. We're bringing it back. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is going to push us further away from that homeostatic window. That's somewhat counterintuitive. Don't we want to keep it in a homeostatic window? Yes, of course we do. But there are times when the emergency needs a reinforcement of the departure from homeostasis. And I'll give you some examples of that. And then we have this third one. And this one's really, really interesting. Now you can, you know, we'll use a simple example and then we'll go to a little more complicated. But again, it's a really, really fun one um, once you begin to see it in, in our world. And I'll, I'll give you some really great examples of this. And I see now that we're approaching our sort of our target time of around half an hour. I've only got a few more slides, so I'm just going to kind of squeeze an additional couple minutes in here. So just hang with me. Temp body temperature is a classic example of uh, negative feedback. The body temperature decreases. We have a perception, uh, an integration, and a response to, to raise body temperature back, and vice versa. P body pH, blood glucose, uh, any number of things, oxygen concentrations, CO2 concentrations, are all examples of regulated variables that we frequently uh, use negative feedback for, many of our endocrine systems as well. And here I go contradicting myself because I just talked about endocrine systems as a primarily negative feedback. Well, here's an endocrine system that is positive feedback. We're going to push us further away from the homeostatic window. The key with, with, with positive feedback, and this picture right here is a mechanism of positive feedback. You can write it in in your notes. This, this is an example of positive feedback. What happens is when a baby gets large enough, when it is approaching what we call term, 
the 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 head of the feet of uh, the of the uh, of the of the I'm going to say fetus. It's no longer a fetus. It's now a nearly fully formed individual. So I'm going to call it a baby. The baby's head begins pressing on the cervical wall. So it's causing cervical stretch. That stretch, that that uh, that pushing, that dilation of the cervix, the effacement of the of the head in the cervical position stimulates. It causes sensors in the cervix to send signals to the uh, hypothalamus to release a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin then is released from the hypothalamus and then it triggers uterine contractions. So when we have enough cervical stretch, we have enough oxytocin that we begin to go into labor. And so we're contracting the uterus to push that baby uh, out, out the canal. Okay, that push causes more cervical stretch, more oxytocin, more contractions, and so forth and so forth. We have to have some sort of outside factor that changes this dynamic in order to stop this positive feedback cycle. And that's when the baby delivers or begins suckling uh, on, on, uh, on the breast. That triggers a block. And that's what this little symbol is right here. When you see this line going into sort of a, 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 a T-like, that means that this is inhibiting or blocking this. This outside circumstance blocks this positive reinforcement. Have you ever heard of somebody being induced? Okay. Well, when somebody's induced, what happens is uh, the mother is given oxytocin in the form of a drug called pitocin. Okay, pituitary oxytocin. They give them a dose of oxytocin. It triggers uterine contractions, and we induce labor using an artificial uh, bolus of oxytocin. That's how we can induce induce uh, a baby to be born. Here are the silver thornograms for negative and positive feedback. And I would strongly suggest you get to know these silver thornograms. The initial stimulus causes a response that then diminishes the stimulus and shuts it off. Okay. So the, st the, the loss of stimulus causes a, a shutdown of the response. Stabilizing, returning to a homeostatic set point. Whereas positive feedback reinforces the response, causing additional stimulus. You have to have an outside factor to shut off this feedback cycle. That's why when we talk about physiology, we talk about the off mechanisms as often as we talk about the on. Because the off mechanisms, if we don't have it, this could lead to pathophysiology. Feed forward is the trickiest one. It's the most complex, generally speaking, of the three. Usually involves multiple response pathways. And the best example of a feed forward response would be Pavlov's dogs. Okay. What happens is you condition the dog to begin salivating even though there's no food present. So if we give a dog food, it will begin salivating, not only in its mouth, but also in the gastrointestinal tract. Initially, if that dog is not conditioned, we give it a, a signal like a bell, it will not salivate. However, if we condition that dog, it will salivate even though there's no food present. That's what we call feed forward. It's an anticipatory response. It is anticipating a change in homeostasis, and that's what feed forward is. An example of a feed forward, uh, a relatively simple feed forward response, actually in concept, is this idea of uh, spiking a volleyball. You have the, uh, the ball stimulus, you go up and you go through a range of motion. You're not thinking through that entire range. Uh, somebody who is proficient in spiking a volleyball, they simply think, I want to spike it, and their body sort of enters a, a response pathway. It anticipates the ball being in a location and then spiking it. And if the ball, for whatever reason, changes course, they often will follow through as if they had hit the ball. That's because most of this is occurring uh, below the uh, in the neurons uh, uh, below the cerebral cortex. Let me give you another really awesome example of feed forward that is occurring. So here's LeBron James going up for a, 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 a dunk, but what happens is the ball disappears 
from his hand, even though his brain is perceiving that ball is gone, nevertheless, his arm is still going through the motion of slamming that basketball. That's an example of feed forward. This idea of anticipating a change in, 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 uh, in circumstance, environment, condition before the actual change occurs. Okay, so wrapping this up, we have these major themes. The key here when you're taking notes in your book is to look for these major things. Look at the examples that we use. When we do the exams, we're going to be use, we're going to be asking questions about these things and how you talk about them. We're not doing any multiple choice this uh, this semester. We're going to be doing all written uh, responses, and so practice your written responses. Think of examples. Think of how you would describe these things and how you would write about them if you were talking about them, say, in front of a, an audience or or with a patient. All of these things are major ideas and look at those examples and then uh, apply those in your life. And that's, that's learning, that's application. So thanks for your time. We'll move on to chapter two in our next video and our next uh, discussion. Thanks.